Bucknutters. Welcome to the Bucknuts Morning 5 here on Wednesday, September 27th, 2017. I am Dave Biddle, and I'm very happy to be joined by the people's champ, Matt Baxendell. Bax, you know, I'm, I'm big on keeping politics off our website and certainly off this show, but, I mean, everything's intertwined now. It's stick to sports. It's impossible now that it's kind of... Uh, reached its uh, ugly hand in the sports. And J.T. Barrett last night after Ohio State's interviews was asked about the protest in the NFL and, you know, with the players kneeling during the national anthem or not even coming out of the locker room, some of the players. And at first you could tell, you know, he didn't really want to give much of an answer, but he kept, you know, he, he was asked about it several times and um, eventually just kind of, you know, gave his true feelings. Didn't say anything bombastic, but here's his quote um, that I think is pretty interesting here. He says, I saw the comments that President Trump said. It was like, quote, what are you talking about? That's why we're the United States. We have the ability and we have the freedom of speech to protest whatever we want. It really doesn't matter. You could be all the way in left field. It really doesn't matter. But it's the fact that that's who we are as Americans. And the fact that he kind of tried to quiet people down and silence people, that was really wild to me, end quote. So basically JT saying he didn't blast President Trump, which I thought that was good. Um, but you know he did basically say he's on the side of the players, and he said that's what make us makes us Americans. Again, I hate to even talk about this, but I'm sure we posted a story last night to the site. A lot of people are already talking about it. Uh, I just want to get your thoughts on the matter, Bax. Well, JT's a good kid. We talk about how he can't throw down field. That has nothing to do with the human being that JT Barrett is. Um, and look, everybody has their own personal opinion on this stuff. I learned a long time ago writing the bucket that you know. You make one joke about some dumb politician and people think that you're a bleeding heart liberal or a warmongering, you know, conservative or whichever one in between, right? Um, the truth of the matter is he's right. We at the United States of America, our most dear value is the First Amendment is the protection of freedom of speech. Um, people have the freedom to protest as they see fit. And I personally have the fr- freedom to disagree with people kneeling during the end. Um, better ways to protest it, but I've had this discussion numerous times. You know what? We are a nation where there's no such thing as a thought crime. Uh, you have the right to believe in what you believe and make that belief known. And so JT's thoroughly correct on that. Um, I will say this in closing, though, because, again, this isn't the Bucknuts morning five bucket of politics bullets or anything. Um, I'm very pleased in college football that the players don't come onto the field until after the anthem because I watched numerous NFL teams twist themselves and not not be ready to play football games this weekend because they were trying to figure out how not to piss people off while trying to give their own opinions on things. I watched the Pittsburgh Steelers disastrously play against the Chicago Bears while spending the whole pregame trying to figure out how they were going like, to stand in unity but not like offend people, right? Keep them in the locker room. Nobody's kneeling during an anthem, and we can get worry about football, you know. That's kind of the way I look at it at this point. And, you know, free speech should be protected. And But when we talk about sticking to sports, it's hard to stick to sports when everything else is shut down your throat at the same time. Yeah, very well said. I thought JT gave a very good answer. And, again, this wasn't something he wanted to talk about, you know. Uh, a couple different reporters kept peppering him with questions. And, uh, you know, he was, you know, Again, at first he didn't really want to talk about it. He didn't say I don't want to talk about it. You could tell he didn't really want to talk about it. But then he just gave his, his honest uh, opinion. I thought he handled the situation well. This has got to be like walking on eggshells for some of these kids, especially when you're talking about these are kids answering these questions. I mean, we watched the professional athletes walking on eggshells trying to talk about this. This is this is tough sledding when you ask, you know, we're really kids. I mean, I certainly was not a man when I was in college. I, I still had a lot of growing up to do. These are still kids. I know you can make the argument, oh, well, they can vote. They can fight in the military. I get all that. But I tell you what, we can go down the list of Ohio State players that certainly were not men yet while they're still playing football for Ohio State. Now, J.T. Barrett might be the exception to that rule. He is a man's man, even at his young age. But, man, I, I wish, even as a member of the media, these kids didn't have to ask these questions, but I thought J.T. navigated that about, about as well as you could, Bax. This is not what they're here to do. But the college players, the pro players, look, everybody gets a political opinion. And everybody's opinion is something that they are entitled to as free people in this nation. But the, the pros to talk about this. We have Alejandro, you know, like, Phil in the way that is apologizing for standing alone with his hand on the heart during the flag. These guys are twisting themselves. Like, I'm expecting someone to take a knee this weekend, holding a sign up saying, I support the troops. Like, 
this is something these guys are wanting to be involved in. It's not a foisted on them. And I, I don't blame JT for going, I don't want to talk about this. It's all everybody else is talking about, but we don't want a part of it. In general, you and I would rather be talking about Tough Borland playing well or what Kendall Sheffield's going to do to improve, not what Trump tweeted about and not what, you know, whether Kaepernick is somehow going to get signed because of his political opinion or whether people should have kneeled or stood arm in arm. We want to talk about sports, but, you know, this isn't, this isn't what these people are at OSU to do. They're not here to play politics. That's right. Let's move on. I, we've already talked way too much about politics. I did want to touch on it. It's like the elephant in the room. I did a story for the site last night. As I said, people are already commenting on Bucknuts left and right about it. And I know a lot of people are just across Ohio State message boards and radio shows are going to be commenting about it because these kids – and JT wasn't the only one. Jalen Holmes was asked about it. There were other kids that came out last night. Um, Shiana, we talked to him last night. Um, he was not asked about it. Um, but so of course the, the man who's getting paid is not asked about it. But all these kids that are not getting paid are asked all the tough questions. Yeah. So let's move on. We've already talked enough about that. Um, Jordan Fuller, another kid that came out last night to be interviewed. You know he's from Jersey. He gets a chance to go home, play against uh, home state Rutgers this week. And uh, yeah, he's a kid. I think I watched Jordan Fuller backs. I don't think he's just going to be good or maybe just you know second team all Big Ten eventually. I think this kid has all American potential. I mean, he's going to be I see him as a future NFL not just player, but a guy that can be like an NFL stud and and I just see him coming on and on and on and he he's he's mature off the field. He interviewed him, he's very mature. I just see Jordan Fuller continuing to get better. Maybe by that but even by the end of this season he he could reach you know that that level where he's playing at, at a star level. Yeah, and we're all spoiled right now because we watched Malik Hooker have the best season any safety has had in modern history at Ohio State, right? So right. Fuller has a very unfortunately high bar to follow. And honestly, he's been pretty good this year. Uh, he's only a true sophomore. He's got a lot of time to develop. He's a good football player. Um, you know, I, I may not have the same opinion of his ceiling yet as you do, but I think he certainly can be very, very good. I'm, I'm very interested to see how he does over the rest of the season because him and Damon Webb having a very strong last two-thirds of the season is going to be very helpful for this pass defense to sort of come together. And it was good to see the two of them have a strong showing against UNLV. I like Fuller. He's a good, rangy player, man. And I certainly think he's earned the, the starting nod opposite Webb. Uh, it's going to be very interesting to see, though, if his ceiling – is anywhere in Malik Hooker's stratosphere, or is he just going to be a very good safety at the Ohio State level? Greg Schiano going back to Rutgers. Um, I mean, it's got to be surreal for him. I asked him about that last night. Uh, we'll have the video up uh, of the full Schiano interview later today on Bucknuts. But, uh, I mean, I asked him, it's got to be surreal for you going in the visitor locker room. He said, yeah, well, I've been in there before because we did other stuff like while he was there. But, I mean, this is a guy that took Rutgers – from nothing, pretty much. And at one point, they were not just ranked. They were ranked in the top ten. Rutgers was ranked in the top ten, yeah. uh, top eight, to be accurate, and, and to be specific. I, I just, I'm, I'm so impressed with, you know, looking back on what he did there. Talk about that a little bit. And also, talk, I know it's early. Talk about it. Are you impressed with the job he's done with the defense, or you, do you think he's left a little bit to be desired so far as the sole defensive coordinator thus far? Well, first of all, what Greg Schiano did at Rutgers is nothing short of miraculous. That was the worst program in college football for 100 years. They like to talk about how they did the first college football game. They didn't get any better. Um, you know, <laughs> like the game improved and people actually wore helmets and Rutgers was still that same terrible program that played Princeton in 1870-something or whenever it was, right? But <laughs> you're right. You remember they upset Louisville in 20, or 2006. That was the year that Greg Schiano cursed his name for a couple of years because if they hadn't upset Louisville and Piscataway that one night where they kicked that field goal that they missed and then they got to re-kick it because of the offside, it would have been Louisville, Ohio State in 2006 with Brian Broma a quarterback in the title game. And Urban would never have the chance to have embarrassed us the way he did. How different is everything then? But what he did was amazing. And Greg, the, the Big East at the time wasn't as good as the Big Ten is today. But, like, that program stunk before him, got really good with him, and then fell right back off a cliff and he left. So, Greg, 
job at Rutgers was miraculous, to say the least. And that program isn't anywhere near where it was when he left. Uh, as for this year, look, it, it's not like he had last year's team all of a sudden to work with. Cristiano inherited a defense last year that had three first-round picks in the secondary. Uh, he, he's done a good job this year. I can't complain. It's not like he can make Kendall Sheffield cover tighter. Um, you know, he, he, he's done a good job of getting that D-line in a position to succeed. I'm interested to see how he adjusts to the Borland emergence that's starting. Will he move Worley back out to outside linebacker? Are we going to see some of these younger guys start to take some reps from Sheffield? Because Sheffield so far hasn't cut it. But I think Shiano's lived up to the hype the last year and a half. Great recruiter. Done a very good job. And then most importantly, I've consistently thought his halftime adjustments have been pretty good. Really, the Oklahoma game is the only one you can say Shiano didn't adjust well at half. And that game kind of snowballed just in general. Look what he did with Indiana at halftime. Indiana was throwing the ball at will. And Ohio State changed their coverage up, changed the way they were pressuring the quarterback up, and they're very successful in the second half. So I think Shiano's every bit the 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 hype that they've been talking about. I think it's going to be very interesting to see if Shiano's here beyond this year with some of these other jobs opening. I know people talk about Notre Dame a lot as a potential landing spot for him. Sounds like Mike Weber's going to return this week. In fact, Urban Meyer says he, he will play this week. I still wonder – how much he will play, because do they really need him against Rutgers? I'm sure he'll get out there and get a few carries. You know, I'm told he could have played last week if there was the Michigan game or something, but why not give him an extra week? He keeps re-injuring that pulled hamstring. Um, we've talked a lot about J.K. Dobbins. We've talked a lot about Mike Weber. Uh, I want to finish the show talking about Antonio Williams. I mean, this kid, if Weber does return, is able to play a little bit this week. Antonio Williams is the third-string running back. Demario McCall is back now as well, which I think is really good. But Antonio Williams impressed me. I know it was against UNLV. I know it was against their most, mostly their second string defense. Although he played against their first string defense uh, a little bit as well. I, and I'm not saying he's going to end up you know, being a starter at Ohio State or ever a star. But man, as a third or fourth string tailback, I mean, you know, first world problems here. I mean, this is I mean, that's pretty nice when you have a guy like Antonio Williams as your third or fourth string tailback backs. Yeah, my look after the Indiana game was is that if you picked Antonio Williams as the first touchdown of the year in the pool, man, your odds would have been amazing. Um, <laughs> better than the Browns winning the Super Bowl, that of all players, he scored the first PD. But he's been good this year, man. Like, he's never going to be a J.K. Dalton game-breaking level player. What he has the potential to be is a very good north-south runner who can spell your starter. He's a guy who can come in and be competent. You know, for every Maurice Claret, there was a Lydell Ross. Maybe that's not the best comparison because Ross was lacking in certain spots. But you know, for, for every Beanie Wells, there was an Antonio Pittman, right? I think Antonio Williams is going to be a, a very solid depth guy. And that alone is impressive because we thought, looking at the depth chart, a lot of people wondered if he'd even be here this fall, being fourth on the depth chart this spring. So what he's in the first four games is – I don't want to say a revelation, but it's been very nice to see that he's been able to succeed at the level that he has. But, again, this guy was a four-star recruit, too. I mean, this is a guy who was a top-ten tailback whenever he committed to OSU. So, thought he doesn't have some pedigree, and just because he's not a video game like J.K. Dobbins or he's not, you know, a top-five pick like Zeke doesn't mean he's not going to be a good college tailback. So, a guy like that is really nice to have on the roster, and seeing him do it in games only adds to his chops. There's going to be spots found that you can. And if Mike Weber can't come back at a full scale, because that hamstring situation, those things linger. If I was Urban, I would not even play him until Penn State at this point. He's your hammer. He's your he's a guy, but it's fourth and one, you give him the ball and get the first down, right? I don't know if Weber is he, he, as good at that as Weber is. So, in the interim, why not play Williams against Rutgers in Maryland, who's not a skip quarterback out in Nebraska? You can beat those teams and probably succeed very well with Williams coming out of the backfield as your number two option. So, you know, all these things are talking. The fact that we've dedicated this much time to Antonio Williams, if you told me that in office, I would have asked, oh, my God, did everyone get hurt? No, it's because he's done well. And that's a compliment to the young man. Yeah, I wanted to give the kid some love there. Yeah, I thought he's uh, – who knows how much he's going to play the rest of the year. They're not gonna, there's no more UNLVs on the schedule. Rutgers might be the closest to UNLV. Although Rutgers is an improved team, especially defensively, which is no surprise considering – who their head coaches and Chris Ash and great stuff as always from the People's Champ Matt Baxendell. I appreciate it, my friend. You can catch Bax's column every week on Bucknuts. It is of course the bucket. It runs every Sunday, so make sure you check out the bucket. 
Thanks to all the listeners out there for tuning in to the show. I appreciate it. Hope you have a great day. Let's show that Buckeye swag, best damn band in the land. Fire, 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 fire.